So good morning, everybody. This is Andrew Kosky, uh, Vice President for Program Policy and Services at the Home Care Association of New York State. I want to welcome you to this Home Care Emergency Preparedness and Management Forum. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Home Care Association of New York State and also the New York State Association of Healthcare Providers. We are partners uh, working together with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on emergency preparedness activities. A couple of housekeeping details, questions, if you can put them into the chat box, that would be great. Um, everyone is muted, but later on during our discussion portion, you can either unmute yourself or you can put questions into the chat box. Um, at the end of the program, I'm sorry, after the program, we will send out the handouts and also an evaluation form. So let me just quickly go over what the agenda looks like, and then I will introduce Fidel Monroe. So obviously the welcome for us we're going to discuss, Carol and I will discuss the assessment survey findings. Um, Zach Goldfarb will talk about how to complete a hazard vulnerability analysis. There'll be a discussion uh, following that, and then we'll discuss some of the recommendations made in the survey report. And then I'll close with um, upcoming activities. So I want to thank, first of all, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, for partnering with us, where we actually have a grant, both us and and HCP to work on emergency preparedness. And I want to introduce Fidel Monroe with the New York City Department. Fidel. Good morning. Thank you, Andrew. As Andrew stated, I'm Fidel Monroe, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Office of the Emergency Preparedness and Response, and specifically the Bureau of Health Care and Community Readiness. As the New York City home care sector continues to participate in the New York City Health Care Coalition, it is my wish that with the provision of activities such as this home care forum, the sector gives increased attention to emergency preparedness and the ability to respond to any emergency whilst providing continued care to clients in the community. In March 2022, the Home Care Association of New York State, HCA, and New York State Association of Healthcare Providers, HCP, conducted an emergency management assessment survey to both certified home health care agencies and licensed home care service agencies. 109 respondents to the emergency management survey not only helped to identify gaps in emergency preparedness, but requested assistance with specific areas. Today's home care forum will not only discuss the findings of the survey and begin to address the areas that will strengthen the sector's emergency preparedness capacity, I will also highlight how the home care sector can benefit from the emergency preparedness support of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you for attending. Andrew, back to you. Thank you, Fidel. And uh, the next slide, please. And next one. Okay, so we're gonna discuss the grant background, some goals and objectives, methods, results, and as I mentioned earlier, survey. I'm sorry, summary and recommendations. Uh, next slide. And again, I want to acknowledge the UC Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. You heard from Fidel Monroe, but also Darren Pruitt, um, Director of Evaluation, and Danielle Salacito have been our partners and have provided um, integral assistance in the past year on this grant and are working with us on the current grant year. Uh, grant disclaimer, next slide. Uh, the program is supported by the Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, ASPRA. Um, so this, anything that's said today is not attributed to ASPRA, but it's the responsibility of the authors. And I will say ASPRA is an incredibly good resource for emergency preparedness, so you definitely want to look at that. Okay, next is a quick grant background. So again, New York City, I think, recognized that it was important to work with the home care sector um, to help us build up situational awareness, education, and training. Um, and as you know, the home care sector serves lots of folks, about a half a million folks a year. And we have decentralized staff and patients that necessitates additional planning and technical assistance. You can always use additional guidance, uh, which the city has actually provided a lot of now. And during COVID and other times, we've had less access to respiratory protection resources. Um, and that's very important, obviously, in the work that we do. So I want to go to the next slide, the scope of deliverables. 
So this is what we're supposed to do this year, HCA and HCP. Uh, we, one of the, so one of the things is we plan and conduct long-term care emergency preparedness webinars. On October 25th, we had a safety in the home webinar. Over 200 folks representing New York City participated. We'll be doing another webinar um, next in, in the spring, I guess. And I know HCP, I believe, is also doing a webinar. Uh, as you know, we, we, we'll, we, we'll, we're conducting a forum today and we'll be doing another forum next year. And then we'll be doing a emergency management needs survey. So this is a survey that will be sent to home care providers and it's following up on a survey we conducted last, well, this past year, and we'll be discussing the findings of that survey. Okay, next slide. So the goals that we, the goals and objectives that have been completed under the prior year, so to engage the home care sector in identifying its emergency management capabilities, to identify areas needing improvement, and the ultimate purpose is to build and sustain New York City's public health and healthcare preparedness capabilities. And the survey helped us a lot to identify areas needing improvement. And then to utilize the results of this assessment to plan activities and develop initiatives for future um, ASPR formula grant years. So I'm going to stop now and we're going to send, we're going to do one polling question. And Ariana, if you could put that up there. It's a pretty simple polling question. If you can read it and answer, did you participate in the prior 2022 emergency management survey that I mentioned we held last year in February and March? Yes, no, or not sure. And then the second question is, do you plan to participate in our upcoming emergency management survey? And that again, will be sent out sometime probably in February or so. So just fill it out and then if you hit submit. And I'm going to let you decide when you want to stop it. How many people okay. have responded? Can you guys see the question? Uh, right now, I just see the slide, slide eight. I can see the polling questions. Both questions are up there, which we can do both now. Okay. Can you can can folks select an answer? Yeah, yes. I was able to submit. Thank you. Okay, Anna. great. Yes, thank we'll, you. We'll keep it up for a little bit longer, maybe another 15 seconds. Okay. Great, thank you guys. How do we do on our responses? Um, let me, I, I, I X'd out of it by accident, so I will have to pull it back up. <laughs> no problem. Why don't we go, um, why don't I go over this? Yeah, I can go over slides nine and 10, and then you hopefully will have it, and then I'll introduce Carol. Sounds okay, good. great. So if we can go to the methods slide, the next one. So as Fidel mentioned, we sent out a survey. The data was collected last March to April. Um, the assessment covered a range of topics, including hazard vulnerability analysis, emergency management staffing, emergency communications, education, drills and exercises, emergency supplies, all areas that home care providers um, have to be involved in when it comes to emergency preparedness activities. Uh, next slide. And we had an incredible response. About a third of the agencies um, responded, and uh, 92 were Lixes and 17 were Chas. And the home care agencies that responded said they provide services to over 156,000 patients in the five boroughs, and they employ about 18,000 full time and 44,000. Again, these are the survey respondents, obviously, not all of the agencies that serve New York City. So let me stop and see if Ariana can share the results or verbally tell us the results of the survey results. I am going to have Taylor 
um, share the results on her okay. end. Great. I think she's able to, or I can verbally say it right now. Um, about 39% um, did participate in the 2022 EM survey. Um, about 46%, they weren't not sure if their organization did, and about 15% did not. Um, and for the second question, we have about 83% of the participants are planning on participating in the upcoming survey. Um, and about 13% that they're not sure if they're going to. Okay, great. And I would encourage folks, obviously this is very important when the survey does come out, You'll get lots of notifications, more, more than you want probably, um, but I would encourage you definitely to respond back. We look at the survey, we actually put, up, put together a report based upon that. So let me just, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle Leo, who's the Senior Associate for Public Policy at HCP. And thank you, Carol. Thanks, Andy. And thanks, Ariana, for that um, poll. 83% said they're gonna participate. So we're gonna hold you guys to that when that new survey comes out, um, hopefully roughly the same time in the spring, March. Um, so like Andy said, it only takes about 15 minutes and it really, really informs our efforts. So please do participate when you get it. Next slide, Ariana. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the results of the survey that we did last year. The assessment identified the sector's strengths as well as opportunities for improvement in emergency management and planning activities. There's a lot of information on the following slides when we're talking about these results and you will receive a copy. So no need to uh, try to jot down or note every statistic because there's gonna be a lot of them. We're just gonna go through them quickly so that you can get an overview of what we learned by our first assessment survey. So on this slide, we talk about an emergency management plan. And you all know that the purpose of a plan is to outline your procedures so that you can continue the delivery of services with minimum disruption during an emergency. And what we found from our respondents is that they are in great shape when it comes to having a plan and when it comes to keeping it up to date. Policies and procedures are in place for the most part, and nearly all agencies reported having a procedure to notify patients in the event of an emergency. 97% of them are able to notify patients when an emergency is um, in process. Next slide, please. Hazard vulnerability analysis. This was one topic that Andy mentioned we covered in our survey. And as you know, it's usually the first step in emergency planning for any organization, not just in healthcare. And there are lots of HVA tools designed so that you can identify the hazards and risks for your operation. That's the important thing to know is that an HVA is unique to your organization. It needs to be individualized. So in our survey, about a third of our agencies that responded reported not completing this step annually, and about a quarter of them have not done an HVA. It's because of these numbers and considering that 84% of our respondents requested additional information on HVA that we planned this particular forum to focus and just focus on this activity on HVA and discuss how you can get started and how you can keep yours up to date. And Zach is going to join us in just a bit to do just that, walk you through the process. But first, we're going to just wrap up some more of our summary findings. Next slide, please. So this chart, chart shows the risks, hazards, and vulnerabilities that were included in our respondents' hazard vulnerability analyses. This was for New York City last year. And you can see the breakdown and the top five are pandemic and infectious diseases. That probably comes as no surprise since that's been top of mind for a lot of us, <laughs> most of us, unless you've been living under a rock. Natural disasters were next, which include weather events, patient-related care emergencies, technological failures, which includes power outages or problems with heating and cooling systems. And finally, transportation issues and interruptions rounded out the top five hazards and vulnerabilities that our agencies identified when they're doing their HVA. Transportation problems, usually in home care, involve interruptions getting staff to and from the patient's homes. Next slide, please. Another topic we explored in our survey was emergency communications. There are various regulations 
guidance, state and federal rules that home care providers have to follow in following a communication plan. The associations, uh, based on our survey and these results that you see, have decided to delve a little bit deeper into emergency communications as um, experienced by the home care sector, as experienced and as used by the home care sector. You can see that most agencies on the bottom bullet there rely on telephones, cell phones, calls, and texts as primary and secondary modes of communication. It's important to consider other modalities because what if a cell tower goes, at, goes out, right? You do not have the option to even use email on your phone if you don't have any cell service. So our future assessment next year is going to explore different communication modalities, and just at least get people thinking about other um, methods they could use to communicate in case of an emergency. Next slide, please. Just to talk a little bit more about communications, one of the issues brought to light by our assessment was the sheer number of different emergency communication sources that agencies might receive notices from during an event. You have IHANS, New York City sources, the long-term health system support liaison, emails coming from the state, from the city, from your local partners. That's a lot of information coming at you during an emergency. We're hoping that in this year's survey, we can attempt to discover what works for home care and what could be improved when getting information out to the home care sector when there's an emergency. We have workers in the field, you know, 90% or more of our workforce is in the field and we need to know how to reach them and how to have administration get all the information it needs in a timely fashion. Next slide, please. Another topic that we covered in our survey was emergency management education. And of course, home care staff have to be trained in emergency management. And our survey showed that agencies are certainly getting that done including, as I mentioned earlier, providing notification and materials to their patients. Nearly 90% of our survey respondents said that they provide educational materials to their patients. Next slide, please. We have a little more on education. Um, there's a lot of information here. <laughs> as we said, you will be getting this slide. I just wanna to touch on a couple of things we wanted to point out. 80% of our respondents reported at least having annual training in emergency management for registered nurses. That number dropped to 58% for home health aides and 50% for personal care aides as far as annual training in emergency management. One other thing that stuck out to us is that 23% of respondents selected not applicable for holding ongoing training for personal care aides. There were even higher percentages for therapists at 73% and licensed practical nurses at 52% as being not applicable for the organization. So when we were writing our summary, this got us to thinking, why are these, um, these titles considered not applicable? Is it because they're not being trained or is it indeed because the agencies don't employ that type of worker? So that highlighted the need for a deeper look at who gets what kind of training in a home care agency. Because of this, the need for clarity, we are going to include more detailed training questions on next year's survey. So you can watch for that, those 83% that said they're gonna participate. Next slide, please. Just a couple more topics we wanted to highlight for you in our results before we bring Zach up. I know he's anxiously waiting to talk to you. Um, we queried our home care agencies about drills and exercises. And as you know, there are many ways an agency can hold drills and exercises. Despite dealing with pandemic conditions, home care agencies participated in emergency management drills of various types, both locally, uh, Department of Health, State Department of Health, New York City Department of Health. And we were very pleased to see that despite the pandemic, as I said, home care agencies increased their involvement by five and a half percent in exercises from 2019 over 2021. The assessment showed that the industry would benefit from stepping up our efforts to collaborate with community partners for drills. As you can see, only 9% of our respondents participated in exercises and drills with community partners. Keep in mind that the person you rely on most during an event is often your next door neighbor. 
So community partner exercises help establish those connections. And we hope to explore more ways in our work with the Department of Health in New York City to um, get the home care more involved in those community partner drills. One more topic to hit on, and then we're gonna go into HVA. Talk real quick about emergency supplies and PPE, personal protective equipment. I'm sure you're all familiar with that term. The pandemic showed how important supplies are during an emergency. And the survey demonstrated that among those with stockpile standards, there was no common method for establishing levels of inventory. We hope to look at industry standards, <clears throat> excuse me, for supply inventories in order to help home care providers in setting adequate levels and establishing alternate supply chains. As you all know, you probably all, all used during the recent pandemic when, when things were, were hard to come by at, early on. One last slide, Ariana. Thank you. So this chart sums up the areas of emergency management for which agencies want additional information. Our respondents indicated all the areas, they could check more than one, they could check them all, all the areas that they wanted more information on because this is going to help drive our efforts as we go forward having forums and webinars for your information. You can see that HVA is by far the number one requested topic. That is why we chose it for today's webinar. And with that in mind, please help me welcome Zach Goldfarb, President of Instant Management Solutions, He's going to walk us through the creation of a hazard vulnerability analysis for your organization. Thank you, Zach, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay, just on the sound check? Yes, yes sir. We can. You're great. Excellent. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. So we're going to spend a little time speaking about the hazard vulnerability analysis today, and my aim for doing this is to both illustrate to you the importance of doing an HVA and also show you some strategies for how to get it done. Uh, most of the time when something seems overwhelmingly difficult or challenging to us, it's because we don't perhaps have a thorough understanding of best ways to do it. So we're gonna try and shine some light on that today and leave you with a better understanding of how the HVA process works. And I'm gonna start with talking about why it's uh, so important for us to do that. Uh, slide, please. So, you know, when you are asked to put together an emergency plan, the very first logical question that might come to your mind is, what do we need to plan for? And even though we speak about all hazards planning and the general concept of we need to plan for everything, uh, it's still helpful to understand that in the scheme of everything, there are some things that are either more likely to occur to us or are put us at a greater vulnerability than others. Uh, you can see here, obviously, some uh, images of things that happen and could affect us, but of course, many things could affect us. So the purpose overall for conducting a hazard vulnerability analysis is to address that question of what could happen and what are those things that are going to affect us the most? It's a very important first step in any emergency management program. The beauty of doing an HVA, as we'll get into, is that once you put it together the first time and you take the time to get it right, the annual maintenance or the periodic maintenance of it is relatively simple and relatively, uh, if it's done right in the first place, it's relatively easy to do. And we'll speak to that. Slide, please. So first question is, what is a hazard vulnerability analysis? And so it's, of course, an important tool in emergency planning. But what it really does is it becomes a needs assessment. It helps you to develop a good understanding of where are we really at risk? And this is why it's worth your time to make the investment of carefully analyzing what your risks are. And as was mentioned a few minutes ago, it's not okay to just copy somebody else's or from another agency and not because it's plagiarizing, but rather because it's not focused on your specific needs. Each home health agency, each environment is different, each community is different, and each one has some different risks. Of course, there are a lot of commonalities as well, but the best way to do this is really to uh, develop that process internally for focusing on what your specific agency's uh, threats or hazards are. So this is a tool that lets us understand what are our threats or vulnerabilities to our ability to provide the service that we do. 
which is ultimately to provide care for our patients. And at the end of the day, the purpose of the HVA is to allow you to prioritize your risks or your vulnerabilities so that you understand what are the highest vulnerabilities. What are those things that uh, put you at greatest risk for not being able to carry out your essential functions as an organization? Slide, please. So why do we do an HVA? Well, the results of the HVA are important because they guide our emergency planning process. You know, ideally, all you would do would be emergency planning and you would focus on this and you'd have a whole team of people that do this, but wait, you can't do that. And actually no organization can do that. So we have to have a little focus. We can't plan for everything. We can't prepare for everything. We can't drill or exercise or train for everything. So we wanna make sure we focus the scarce resources that we can apply to emergency planning on those things that are the greatest potential impact to us. So the higher the risk, the more focused our effort should be on mitigating it. For example, here in New York, it would make no sense if I said, let's have a volcano emergency plan. If we were on the big island of Hawaii, uh, then we would be very happy that we had that plan this week because they're having a volcanic eruption. But that's not our situation in New York and probably never will be. So no point in our spending any time focusing there. However, focusing on a blizzard or a winter storm or a hurricane or a terrorist attack, well, those are things that uh, are more applicable to our situation. And so therefore, an HVA helps to guide us to certainly the obvious risks, but also uh, other risks that may, uh, that may come in our way. So how often do we review an HVA? So really there are three scenarios where you should do it. First of all, as a general principle, you should review it annually. Once a year, you should go through an HVA review and we'll talk about how to conduct that. Second, after a real world event or after an exercise when you're doing your post-incident analysis. For example, uh, in the middle of 2020, organizations that had perhaps prepared their HVA, let's say in January, are now in July of 2020, and they've just gone through the first uh, phase, if you will, of that uh, extreme COVID response. And that was a very tough time, as I'm sure uh, most of you recall. And that was an appropriate time to reassess our HVA and realize that if we didn't have pandemic as our number one risk, we probably should. And if we didn't have supply chain disruption or difficulty in getting PPE as a high risk or our number two risk, we probably should. And that warranted a change in HVA right at that time so that we could focus our planning and our, our response efforts on that real world event. A third scenario might be a change in organizational leadership where a new leader would come into the organization and say, let's look at what our risks are and maybe it's time to reassess. Also remembering that the vulnerability level of any risk in an HVA is related to your mitigation activities, meaning things that you do to harden yourself as an organization so that your risk is lessened. So as an example, if you had a physical facility like a building and you identified your risk of power failure as X, and then you went and installed the generator so that power failure would have less of an impact on you, even if it were to occur, then your vulnerability has been reduced. So we take mitigation activities all the time, whether they're training activities or preparedness, or we acquire additional supplies or update our plans or buy resources. So uh, we should always take that into consideration when we look at our HVA or when we revise our HVA. Slide, please. Now, when preparing an HVA, there are a number of resources that are helpful to you. And I don't mean copying your neighbor's HVA, uh, but rather resources that are available to provide background information to help assess or understand what your actual risks are. So I'm just gonna run through a couple of these. These are all of course available, no charge. And that really just uh, warrants a little bit of time or effort to look them up or gather the content of that information. So uh, the resources, and I'm going to illustrate some of these to you, but the resources might include, for example, a jurisdictional risk assessment, which is a, a public health vulnerability assessment that's done. New York City DOH, uh, DOHMH has put one together, and I'll show that to you in just a moment. Um, local and state mitigation plans. So this is a federal requirement. Every five years, 
uh, jurisdictions, any jurisdiction. So that would include a city, it would include a state, it would include a county if you're outside New York City, have to prepare what's called a hazard mitigation plan. And a piece of the hazard mitigation plan, it's actually a natural hazard mitigation plan. And a part of that is doing a vulnerability assessment for natural hazards that might be found in that particular uh, jurisdiction. So for example, the city has one, I'll show it to you, and so does the state. Um, in New York City, we have a tool called the Hurricane Evacuation Zone Finder. This is published on New York City Emergency Management's website. You see an image of it on the screen there. And this helps us to understand, for example, where are we physically at risk if we're in the city, where are we located? So as part of your assessment or intake of a new uh, home care client or patient, I'm hoping that your uh, intake staff is actually looking at where that patient's home address is relative to their hurricane evacuation zone. And that should be part of that patient's emergency plan that you're preparing. That, that sorry, I paused to look at the, uh, the chat that came up. That patient's emergency plan that you're preparing and also goes into your consideration when, for example, we get a coastal storm warning that this is where you're going to identify or prioritize which patients you should reach out to for their own preparedness. So, uh, so that's very important information. Some of your own internal information, for example, wherever your office is or offices are, uh, do you have floor plans, blueprints? What uh, are the physical layouts where you have accessible to you uh, in terms of the physical space that you occupy and your ability to occupy it? Because that might drive you to making decisions like having a backup site or a hot standby site or some alternate place to relocate to if there were to be a problem in your primary place of business or your communications area. Having that information also about where your staff are located, uh, which would help you to identify what's the vulnerability if staff are impacted or if travel is impacted. Understanding your contracts and your business agreements, important. And finally, community plans and resources. Resources that are available resources that are available to the community or in the community uh, also go into the consideration in terms of preparing your HVA. Slide, please. So this next image is a list of the findings from New York State's most recent hazard mitigation plan, which was done in 2019. So you can see that they've ranked or prioritized the risks from the perspective of New York State uh, Homeland Security and Emergency Services. And they've identified, we could just look at the top three, or actually three, four, and five, because they're all similar, three, four, and five. Number one on the top left of your screen, cyber attack on critical infrastructure. Well, all I could say is look at Suffolk County and what's been going on there since September. And you can see how devastating a cyber attack can be. And that wasn't targeted at critical infrastructure, but that took down the, uh, the computer systems of an entire county's organization and that's an ongoing recovery effort right now. Number two is flood and we know flood nationally and globally is the number one killer of people in natural hazards and uh, we saw for example last September uh, with uh, Hurricane Ida when it blew through uh, the New York City metropolitan area we saw a loss of life and of course disruption in uh, many of our uh, communities as a result of flooding. Number three, I said three, four, and five are similar because they're all terrorist attacks. Complex coordinated terrorist attack, an IED or an improvised explosive device, a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. Uh, you could almost lump those together. But this is just what New York State's planning is. So uh, we can go on from there. By the way, I'll bet if they were redoing that tomorrow, number 12 pandemic would probably be number one, I would think. But they, they do that every five years. Next slide, please. New York City uh, does a hazard mitigation plan and the city's hazard mitigation plan, which by the way, if you have a chance to look it up, it's online. Uh, it's not a document so much as it is an online uh, a website with a series of, uh, of informatics on it. It's really interesting to look at, but the New York City uh, hazard mitigation plan. So one and two seem to go together almost, coastal erosion and coastal storms. Number three is earthquakes, four is extreme heat, five is flooding. So we see a little bit of contrast between the city, which of course is coastal and the statewide plan and, uh, and preparedness uh, or vulnerability assessment. 
and the city goes on to look at some terrorist events. And this also was done a couple of years ago. Uh, number 11 is respiratory pandemic. This was done before COVID uh, prevailed here. Next slide, please. The city DOHMH jurisdictional risk assessment, which was done in 2018, and I believe is in slate to be, uh, to be revised very soon, but this was done also before COVID. So uh, we can see their, their information is organized a little bit differently, but if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see what the findings were of their jurisdictional risk assessment. Number one, cyber attack. Number two, coastal storm. Number three, pandemic. Again, this was before COVID. Number four, excessive heat. Five is chemical emergency. And it's interesting the way DOHMH put this ranking together because they organized to show which hazards are most severe and then which hazards are most likely and then which hazards are we best able to manage. And obviously the things that we're least able to manage give us our highest vulnerability. So, uh, so it's just interesting, three different approaches, three different uh, regional assessments of our affecting our local jurisdiction. Uh, and three different sort of sets of results. So interesting, but number one cyber attack is the city's concern. It was also uh, the statewide concern. Slide please. There's also uh, something that FEMA just released uh, last year, which or earlier this year, I believe, which is called the National Risk Index. And this is an online data set. Again, if you're interested in this, the website is, is shown on the screen. And this is where they look at a, a number of resources, data sets that are available uh, online and consolidate all of this to provide a national risk index. So my reason for showing you all this is just to illustrate to you that there are a series of tools available or resources available to help you in your planning. If you're uh, actually looking at how do I really put together my best possible understanding of where we are at risk, there are a number of tools available to help you find that data both locally, granular in the city, even within the boroughs, and at the state level, and of course, the national picture. Slide, please. So a good question that folks ask is, which HVA do we use? How do we go about that? So there are a number of, of different models that are generally available. Most of them work in, in the same way. The basic essence of an HVA is it, it's a list of risks. And for each risk, we categorize what is the probability of that risk. And then we say, what's the probability, meaning the likelihood that that risk is going to occur. Then we look at the impact that that risk, if it were to occur, would have on us, on our organization. And then we identify how prepared are we to respond to that risk. And then ultimately it gives us a, a score. And this is typically done on a spreadsheet format. And the spreadsheet format, the whole purpose of this is to get a ranking uh, so that we can understand what are our highest vulnerabilities to lowest. That's really the, the primary objective of doing this. Most of the HVA tools that are available work in a similar way. What's commonly seen and what we, I think, provided to be distributed with this uh, meeting today is a tool that was developed by the Kaiser Permanente Health System, originally developed some years ago. It's been revised a couple of times, and I'm going to show that tool to you. We're going to take a little time and uh, work our way around that uh, in today's call. So this tool has been around for a while. Um, really from a compliance standpoint, whatever version or tool your agency puts together is acceptable uh, because there's no requirement that you use a particular tool, simply that you have a hazard vulnerability analysis. But for today's purpose, we're going to show you the, uh, the Kaiser tool with some a little bit of adjustment made for home care agencies because that tool was originally put together for hospitals and then, uh, and then uh, subsequently was adapted for long-term care. Uh, I have not seen a specific adaptation of the tool for home care, so we made one, and I'll show, I'll show you those tweaks and changes in a couple of minutes. Slide, please. <clears throat> Typically what you'll see with an HVA is you'll see it organized uh, to look at four different factors. And sometimes uh, there are other factors added, but, uh, but four different factors that we look at. First is our risk list, right? So we put together uh, essentially a list of every bad thing that we could think of that could possibly affect us. So we typically group those bad things into four groupings. And uh, you'll see in the latest CMS guidance that they, uh, they would like to see these four groupings as well. Uh, naturally occurring events like hurricane or 
earthquake technological events such as power outage or failure of a natural gas system or, uh, or sewer system, uh, human caused events, which would include terrorist attacks uh, or active shooter, uh, active uh, assailant type threat events, and then CBRNE, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear or explosive events, which is essentially hazardous materials uh, or uh, hazardous materials used as weapons type of situations. So typically, uh, when you start to put your HVA together, you want to consider events in all of those categories. Um, in the Kaiser Permanente tool, they break those out so that you have a different sheet for each of those category types or risk types. And then it's consolidated together because ultimately what you really need is a single ranking, not a ranking by type of event, because that's not so helpful. Uh, and so you're looking at the risk list, you're looking at the probability, what's the likelihood that this risk could happen, because that's important. We look at the severity, meaning how badly would we be impacted if that risk were to happen? And then we come up with a score, which is typically a mathematical equation of probability times severity, which is why it makes sense to do this on a spreadsheet format, like an Excel tool, which is how this particular tool is done and how most other HVA tools are assembled. Slide, please. <clears throat> so if you were to look at the Kaiser tool, and by the way, can I presume, uh, Carol or Andrew, that this tool has been distributed to everyone? Do they have access to it? Uh, do we know that? Uh, I, no, we did not distribute it, but we can definitely get links and send it around um, after the program. Okay, and uh, Carol, I think I had sent over um, at the actual files, if you wanted to uh, to send that out at some point, so we'll so definitely, folks, definitely include that when we send out the slides. Great. And so meeting. so this will be made available to to all our listeners uh, after uh, at some point after the call. But when you look at the tool, the Kaiser tool, you'll see that the spreadsheet itself has a header that looks just like this with these colors. This is how it's set up. So I just want to sort of help us navigate what's on here and what it all means. Uh, we'll take that and then we'll see how the tool assembles. So, and below these two uh, header bars that you see on the screen in front of you, of course, is the uh, series of rows with each row representing a single risk. So working our way clockwise uh, around this uh, the screen here, you see the, the first bubble I have there is points of probability. And it illustrates that this is the likelihood that a particular event will occur. So, you know, probability with, terms of, for example, weather events, well, there's statistical data on that in New York City that goes back 130 years or so. So we can actually predict what's the likelihood that we're gonna have a blizzard, a storm or a hurricane or any of those things. In some cases, we don't have a probability. And so what this tool asks you to do is it asks you to identify with the score of zero to three, essentially, is there a low, moderate or high probability of this risk happening? And it's uh, it's pretty subjective, I guess, if you get to that assessment, for example, what's the probability of your having an active shooter uh, affect your workplace uh, or your office or, or some environment like that. So if that were to happen, I, you know, you're gonna make an appraisal. One word of caution I'd offer about gauging probability is to be careful about the recency effect. So recency effect when you work with data is that where data gets weighed more heavily by the people working on it, when something has happened recently. So for example, if the, someone were to walk into a home care agency's office tomorrow and uh, be an active shooter or take hostages, then you're doing the HVA next week and you're gonna say, well, the probability of this is very high because look, it just happened in wherever. Um, but be cautious about that because I think in general, the probability of an event like that happening is really pr pretty low, not impossible, but pretty low. So, uh, so something to watch out for. Uh, then we look at human impact. So moving to the right or clockwise, uh, human impact is looking at the probability for death or injury to staff or residents or patients uh, who are affected by, uh, by this particular risk, the risk you're evaluating. We look at property, uh, the property impact and the property impact. So we're talking about cost to replace or repair uh, property that's affected or to set up temporary replacements or recovery time, but I'll show you uh, uh, shortly that also there are some other considerations that you might look for in terms of property impact and certainly of uh, business impact, which is 
I just move, we'll get around to that as we go clockwise. The next uh, bubble beyond that looks at the external uh, response. And it talks about gauging the types of agreements that you might have with other agencies to support external response or your coordination with other agencies or with other organizations that perhaps could help with your workflow. Continuing around clockwise, uh, we're pointing now to the internal response and we're suggesting looking at things like resources, supplies available. Do you have the supplies, staff availability? Do you have backup systems? In other words, gauging your internal ability to respond to this crisis. Continuing along, I'm on the bottom of the screen now. Uh, we're looking at preparedness. So we're saying, do we have plans for this? How frequently do we drill or exercise this? Do we have an insurance policy that's going to help us react to the situation? How available are our critical supplies and that sort of thing. So these are not absolute statements, but just guides to help you give some consideration to what might be uh, the issue for you. And then finally, uh, on the uh, bottom left of your screen, we're looking back at business impact. And here, again, we look at disruptions that a home health agency might contend with. For example, inability to carry out your day-to-day -day activities, difficulty with your employees able to report to work or to get access to your patients. Uh, vendors who are unable to reach you to provide supplies, uh, financial impact or burden, legal costs, fines, et cetera. So this is uh, the inputs that go into assessing your uh, HVA. Slide, please. And by the way, I'll just mention that if you have any questions or comments on what I'm saying, I will pause for questions before we, we end, and uh, we'll certainly look for them to come up in the chat. And Carol uh, or... Uh, whoever is looking at the chat. If you see any questions, please feel free to flag me and I'll stop and address them. Maybe I'll okay. stop right now. Are there any questions? I've, I've been keeping an eye on them and I also um, put the link in the chat for the tool. Okay, great. But the tool that they will find at the link, which is coming from uh, the actual Kaiser tool, won't have the adjustments that I made for home health that are in the tool that I emailed you. So you may want to include that version as well. Will we'll do, I apologize. No, no worries, no worries. That's our own uh, adaptation to make this tool most useful for home health. So here again, we're looking at that header at the top of our sheet of our HVA tool. And this is just illustrating how the math works. So it's the probability times the severity equals the risk. And it flags to you that severity is really the magnitude, how bad the impact would be minus any mitigation activities that you take. So that's what gives you your metric. And then you have the score at the far right. And since you're doing it in a spreadsheet format, it makes it easy for you to then sort the tool by, the, uh, <clears throat> by that risk list and come out with your rank vulnerability list. Slide, please. <clears throat> So when you look at the tool, you'll look at the file that you get, and you'll see that it's an Excel spreadsheet with uh, five tabs. And the five tabs, the first one is an instruction sheet. The second one is an input for you to put in agency information. <clears throat> the third tool is where you would list your risks, and they are kind enough to provide 74 risks for you, but that doesn't mean that they've included every risk that you might experience. So you still need to look at your local and jurisdictional findings that I was showing you earlier to make sure that that risk list that they put together in California for Kaiser uh, matches your risk list in your community. The fourth tool is an incident log. And what's interesting about this, if you choose to use it, which is not required, <clears throat> but if you choose to use it, the incident log would give you a chance to enter or illustrate every event or, or activation of your emergency operations plan over the course of time. So let's say over the course of a year, you're indicating each time that you activated your emergency plan. When it comes to the following year, those metrics would feed into the HVA to show not just which things are you vulnerable for, but which things have actually impacted you. So then you would be more informed in preparing the following year's plan. So it's an interesting approach and it's an interesting tool. Some organizations use it, not a requirement. You can certainly uh, disregard that whole entry and not put anything there. And then finally, the fifth tab gives you a summary of your findings uh, and lets you understand the, the assessment, gives you the assessment. 
still doesn't sort it for you. So you still need to do that sort yourself, but it's in, uh, it's in Excel, so it's easy for you to format that. Slide, please. <clears throat> I mentioned a couple of adaptations that you would want to make to this HVA tool for home care because there are, home care is not obviously a long-term care facility and certainly not a hospital. So you'll want to make certain adjustments. So here they are. Uh, the first thing is that there's, in most cases, no real need for physical plant-based threats or property impacts because most home care agencies, most the physical plant footprint is a small piece of what the agency does. So things like an elevator failure or a fire alarm failure, these are not really issues for most home health agencies. If you're a large agency, you have a large headquarters building or multiple offices, things like that, you may want to add them or leave them there. But in most cases, you don't need that. Um, there should be consideration added for community-based threats. So community-based threats might include evacuation of a local population because of some risk or hazard that happens in that local community, which from a home health standpoint really affects relocation of your patients. They may be in shelters, they may be with family members, they may be out, out of the community completely. So that should be entering into your consideration. Other things that happen in a community, power outages, flooding, a difficult access to a community that's hard to get to. So those things should go into your consideration about community-based threats. <clears throat> that, Office that, of vacuum, sorry. No, I just want to catch you before you move to the next slide. Please, so, you call me. There was a question, um, I'm going to read it uh, word for word. Who were the SMEs used to adjust the HVA to home health? So these adjustments that we're speaking about right now, we did that, our office, uh, our team put that together. So Incident Management Solutions, we are your local emergency management healthcare experts. Yes, you are. <laughs> thank you. So Thanks. Thank you. Um, any other questions while I wait? Okay. So office evacuation or relocation, certainly that's a unique risk for a home health agency, especially if uh, your business activity is of course driven from your office. Maybe that's where you're communicating with your uh, patients or your staff or doing your planning. So obviously that could be uh, a real vulnerability for your organization. Surge, so surge is something that perhaps historically we didn't maybe give that much thought to, but surge of patients into home care which is a strategy now being used to decant healthcare facilities is something that should go into your vulnerability list. What is your likelihood of having a surge? How prepared are you to manage a surge? How much of a surge could occur? So uh, something to add to your risk list. And then you may have uh, unique external impacts depending on where you're physically located. So uh, there may be unique things in your environment or in your community or in the community that you serve that are unique. So be prepared to consider all of those as you gauge the impact. So what you see on the right side of your screen there is we made that adjustment. The red circle shows the standard uh, Kaiser HVA, which shows property impact. And we adopted that to show external impact. And let me just go on to the next slide and you'll see a little more detail about what I'm speaking about. Slide, that, that does kind of relate to one of our questions, Zach, if I could interrupt you. Please. Um, as we have a home care agency asking if they have nine <clears> offices, <throat> do they do one company wide HVA or do, do they do nine separate HVA? <clears throat> what would you recommend? That's a great question. So if you have nine offices, I think that a home health agency, despite having nine offices, your principal business is probably about caring for the patients. So if the nine offices are simply serving a, a larger geographic area, you have a couple of options. Option one might be to do a geographic-based HVA, for example, in New York City, one per borough. Just putting that out there because your patients, the, the service area of each of your offices might be borough-based. Or perhaps it's not borough-based and perhaps it's a smaller uh, cluster, community-based or community board-based. So you can scale that appropriately. In, within the confines of New York City, we could probably say that our natural hazard risk is relatively the same between the Bronx and Brooklyn and Staten Island and Queens, relatively the same, although certain areas obviously are at greater risk, for example, from coastal storms. <clears throat> so you may need to adapt it a little bit or perhaps same tool, but certain adjustments. Or you may look and say, well, some of our offices, the physical offices are really at greater risk than others. 
because of where they're located or they're uh, on, the, on the waterfront or they're in a high rise building that has other threats. So, so it really requires a little bit of finessing to, to take a look and say, what, what's our general picture here? So what are we most vulnerable for? And then perhaps finessing it. Um, so without a little more specific information, it's hard to give a finite answer. I guess what I'm saying is maybe, right? Maybe you can do it with one tool for the agency, maybe not. If you have one principal office and the others are satellites where folks just check in, get an assignment, leave, that sort of thing, then maybe one for the agency would be adequate. That's um, kind of another illustration of how an HBA has to be completely unique to every organization, right? <laughs> Even even down to whether yeah, you need one or nine, right? It's yes. to your organization. Yes, and, and I'm saying you may not need nine, but maybe you need four, you know, depending on the jurisdiction that you cover. Some home health agencies cover, for example, from New York City out to Long Island and into the Hudson Valley. So in, in that case, you're talking about a very large geographic area. Your natural hazards change and your technological hazards change, your community changes. So there you may need to, to have a sort of more geographically focused HVA. So, Jack, so I had a question which relates to what you're just talking about. The, um, so is there any value to an agency working with another agency who may have the same service area to do a joint HVA, or is it just it's best to do your own agency specific HVA? So uh, if that purpose of the service area would be an assessment of what the risks are, physical risks in that area, then there may be some advantage just on that aspect. But each agency probably brings its own uh, set of resources and mitigation activities to the table, right? So even if we said, let's just say, uh, your agency and mine both cover Rockaways in Queens, let's just say. So we're talking about our risk for hurricanes, right? Or risk for coastal storm flooding. So our risk might be the same, but our vulnerability may not because my agency has boats and we give flotation devices to our nurses and train them in rescue swimming. I'm making this up, obviously. And your agency doesn't have any boats. So our mitigation activities may be different. We may encourage our residents to stay because they all live on upper floors of high rise buildings. Your, your patients may live in bungalows. And so they may be more vulnerable to or need to evacuate faster. So I can't give a blanket answer to that and say, it's perfect. We have to look at it and make decisions that are uh, specifically focused on the unique needs of that agency. Does that make sense, Andrew? Yes, no, thank you very much. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Other questions hanging out there, Carol? Okay, so uh, when I spoke about the unique impacts that home health has, so here are four unique areas that I, I wanna make sure that you consider whatever HVA tool you're using, but please make sure to think about these four things because these are overlooked if you're using a hospital HVA tool <clears throat> or a long-term care HVA tool, you won't see these there. But these are important considerations. Travel impact, right? The ability of your field staff to get to the patients, right? So for example, if we have a community that's isolated because of flooding or isolated because of, of some other weather situation or some other travel situation, if we can't get there, then we have a problem. If mass transit is shut down and most of our staff do their visits using the subway system or buses, and now they are not able to do that because their travel's impeded. That's a vulnerability. We have to understand why that might happen, what's the likelihood, and uh, how prepared are we to offset that in some way. Access could be impeded. So for example, I can arrive at your building, but I can't get to you because you're on the 22nd floor and the elevators don't work in a particular you know, housing project building or something like that. So now uh, you know, it's not my travel that's a problem, but it's my access, so we have to look at that. Missed visits, right? So if we have some situation occurring that forces us to not keep our regularly scheduled visits, maybe because of the volume of patients we have or because of our travel problems or our cycle times are longer or our staff not available to work. If we're missing visits, that's impacting our organization. So that's a risk for us. And finally, if our clients or our patients are relocated, I gave an example earlier, if they're evacuated from a community or from their building for some reason and we can't service them or we have to provide service in an alternate location, how does that impact our organization? So these are some unique impacts that home care uh, encounters that you won't find elsewhere or in other tools. So please make sure to consider these as well. Slide, please. 
So I want to talk for a moment about the process of the HVA meeting process, if you will, of how to go about uh, conducting this meeting and, and what you might do, because this is really uh, an important element for your organization's emergency management coordinator or the team or whoever is working on putting this HVA together. So if you have an HVA currently, that's fine. And you can apply this process perhaps to your annual reviews. If you don't have an HVA and you're starting out from scratch saying now, at least I understand it. And uh, Zach's given us a tool to work with. So now we're gonna set about uh, creating that HVA because I was a little surprised to see that metric earlier. I think I made a note of it. We're 32% of the home health agencies that responded to the survey don't do an annual HVA. And so uh, I'm hoping that you're gonna come away from this with a greater understanding as well as the realizing the need and value, not because CMS says so, but because it's an important tool to, uh, to conduct your annual HVA. So what's the process? Well, the process is you convene the group that's gonna work on this. Who's the group? Well, perhaps your senior leaders who are involved in issues like safety, security, decision-making. I realize you may not have a safety director or a security director, but somebody's involved in this decision-making for your organization. Infection preventionists, nursing, of course, physical therapy, whoever's involved in making the, the decisions, your staffing, your, uh, your business uh, office uh, folks, your admissions folks, whoever's involved, you want to make sure you're at least getting their input somehow. Perhaps subject matter experts in a particular area, if something is uh, uh, pressing for you from a, a expertise standpoint. There are things you want to look at. For example, incident reports from incidents that you've experienced over the past year, after action reports from your exercises, or maybe not from your exercises, but from other activities that have happened in the community or that have affected you. Other inputs that you might get from various communities. Certainly a good thing to do if you have a collaborative relationship or a good a good relationship with folks who are uh, in your community, perhaps working in long-term care facilities, perhaps you've developed a relationship with uh, folks from your healthcare coalition. I hope you're involved with your borough's healthcare coalition. Uh, if you're involved with the uh, emergency management coordinators at your local hospitals or hospitals <clears throat> that provide service to your patients or provide patients to your service either way. These are great resources to talk to to say, how are you assessing these things? Can I look at your HVA? Can I see what you, you have identified as risks or vulnerabilities? New York City Emergency Management's a great resource as well. The Health and Medical Unit from New York City Emergency Management, I'm sure would be happy to help you if you have a question or you're looking for some guidance or input. So there are a lot of resources available to, uh, to guide your assessment. You already have a risk list. You're going to look at that and modify it, but you want to sort of get a gauge of what what are the probabilities or likelihoods of certain things? And there's also just simply a way to think about probability I, I want to mention to you, which is if you have something where you don't have a statistic for it, or you can't find a statistic for it, you might use the following approach to, to get a gauge for yourself. You might say, has this risk ever happened to me? Let's take active shooter, for example, because that comes up so frequently. Everyone talks about that. And by the way, you should know that the likelihood of an active shooter event, the statistical likelihood based on some data the Joint Commission put together last year, uh, the statistical likelihood of an active shooter event in a healthcare facility is something like 0.1%, right? Thinking about how many happen or have happened in any recent memory, uh, as opposed to how many healthcare facilities exist, the statistical likelihood is very low. Not saying it wouldn't be horrible if it happened, only saying that the probability of that happening and affecting your organization is very low. So anyway, we, we take a look at our risk and we say, has this ever happened in our organization? Have we experienced this risk? If we haven't, has it ever happened in any organization like this in our community? So in other words, has our neighboring agency had this experience? No? Okay, has it ha ever happened to an agency like ours? Has any home health agency ever experienced this risk? Or has this ever happened in our community, not in a home health agency, but at all in our community? Has anybody experienced this? These are questions to ask to help you assess how great actually is the probability of this happening? How great actually is your vulnerability? Because the next question would be, if it did happen, how badly impacted were they? Were they out of business? 
where they impacted for a month, a week, a day, an hour, what's the actual effect? And gathering that information, you know, the planning process is always more effective than the plan. Plan is static and it's only as good as when you finish writing it and then you put it on the shelf and it's already uh, minutes to hours uh, old. But the planning process of engaging people, gathering information, uh, giving thought to what implications could be, considering alternate strategies, that's really the win. And that's really the ongoing mechanism that makes us ready for reacting to crisis. So we have this meeting, we bring these folks together, we have a meeting or a strategy session where we discuss and we get an understanding and we work our way through it. One other suggestion I wanna to make to you about the meeting is that when you're analyzing a risk, the first step really in, in analyzing the risk is getting a common understanding of what, how bad a risk are we talking about? So for example, let's assess the risk of a fire in our home health agency office. So if we, several of us are talking about this, our first conversation has got to be, how bad a fire? Because I might think when you say fire, I'm thinking, hmm, okay, I remember we lit up the popcorn in the microwave uh, a couple of weeks ago and there was a little fire in the microwave and we turned the power off and kept the door closed and it went out, right? You might be thinking, well, I was at a place where a whole office burned and all that was left was ashes, all the records, everything was a was a disaster and they went out of business. So we have to develop a common understanding. When we say risk of fire, what fire are we talking about? How bad a fire? When we say hurricane, risk of a hurricane, are we talking about a category one? Are we talking about a category four, which yes, could happen now in, in the New York metropolitan area? How risky, how, how much of a, of a problem are we discussing when we consider what that risk is? So that's a really important assessment piece and worth taking the time to consider. Active shooter, what active shooter? Is he in our office? Is he in our building? Is he on our block? Is he angry with us? Is he angry with somebody else? We want to really understand just so we have a common picture of what that threat is. And when we do that, we always say, develop a realistic worst case scenario. So what do I mean by that? A realistic worst case scenario would be something that is really bad, but has at least a 10% chance of happening. So for example, I'll just to give you an example. When we look at New York City and talk about a realistic worst case scenario for a nuclear event, and there's planning that happens for this. So what's a realistic worst case scenario? It's not an attack from a foreign nation that sends 50 missiles to New York City and leaves us a big smoking hole. That's not a realistic worst case scenario. Could it happen? It could happen. But nobody really expects that that would happen, uh, nor, by the way, would we really need plans for that. But a realistic worst case scenario would be a terrorist with an improvised uh, nuclear device that might be 10 kiloton in size and is put in Times Square. And of course, this scenario has been developed and planned out. So should that happen? Is there going to be devastation and impact? Yes. Is it going to be terrible in Manhattan? Yes. But if you're a home health agency in Queens, you're going to be operational and you're going to have to make decisions like what do we do about our patients? What about additional patients? What about surge? If you're in the Bronx, if you're 20 miles away from Midtown Manhattan, you're going to be working. You're going to be there. And so this is going to affect you. So this is what I mean by saying develop a realistic worst case scenario. And I know that's a scary one, but I want to use it to illustrate the point. Realistic worst case scenario. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, my last point about the HVA meeting, if you will, mm -hmm. is the resources you need to put this together. So you're going to have the meeting. You've identified who you're inviting to your meeting. Uh, of course, things like having an attendance sheet or a sign-in sheet, documenting your process, having a template which we're providing for you, understanding what uh, other tools might be available for a reference like the jurisdictional HVA, Thyra, which is a threat and hazard assessment. This is a level of tool that governments do probably beyond what you need to look at, but I mention it because I know it's come up in other conversations. The JRA, the Joint uh, the jurisdictional risk assessment, I showed you that from the city DOHMH. Perhaps other stakeholders could help you with their risk assessments. Looking at your recent events, things that have affected your organization, and maybe having some way to put this together in a, a projection or a multimedia presentation for your team, depending on how you're doing it. If you have multiple offices and you're engaging staff from each of your local offices to be part of the corporate uh, risk assessment process, then obviously 
you need some way to set this up like a Zoom call or something like that. So this is what, what goes into your process. And finally, uh, slide please. So in the, uh, in the review meeting, uh, I just wanna sort of bring us to this point. So in your annual review, once you've done this once, now you have a tool that looks something like the tool you see on your screen. The annual review is pretty straightforward because what you do is you say, first of all, are there any new risks that we are now are ready to look at that we have not looked at previously? For example, uh, outside our uh, headquarters office, they build a chemical factory and it's possible that there could be a leak there and we'd have to evacuate, but that chemical factory wasn't here last year. It's a new risk. Or perhaps are there any risks we don't need to consider anymore? For example, that chemical factory that was there, they took it away. It's not there anymore. That risk is gone. And of course, that, these are silly examples, but you can appreciate that risk pictures change. They evolve over time. So we have to look and say, what new risks are we contending with? The second thought is, has the probability changed? I gave you an illustration earlier about the uh, supply chain uh, impact when COVID started in 2020. So prior to that, our risk of a critical supply shortage may have been way down on our list because as typical American consumers, we had no problem getting stock of anything we wanted. And then suddenly we realized that that's not the way life always is. And sometimes we could be confronted with really a critical supply shortage. So that shot up our probability very high, actually probability to a certainty because it was happening. It was uh, actually not likely, but uh, we were being affected by it. But now that's come down somewhat. So as we go uh, now to a point where we have stockpiles, we have more supplies, maybe that supply uh, vulnerability has settled down. I wouldn't say it's gone away because certainly it could come back. We could have another wave. Is it seventh wave or up to or eighth? We could have another wave that could be worse than anything else we've experienced. So it's still on the, on the radar scope, but maybe a, less, a lesser vulnerability. So we make that assessment. So first of all, any new risks or old risks that we can get rid of? Second, has any probability changed? Third, has there been any experience with any of these things in the past year to influence our thought process? Fourth, has our realistic worst case scenario adjusted at all? Fifth, have we done any mitigation activities? For example, now we've trained everybody or we've created a new plan or we now have specific equipment to respond to that crisis or resources. And all of that goes into it. And once you've reached those answers, you don't have to reassess each and every threat. Things that haven't changed just haven't changed. And then you put your fresh date on it. Remember that the date is really important. Put your fresh date on it, not the copyright 2016 that you see on the bottom of that sheet, but the date you did the assessment. And then you've completed your HVA review for the year. And I think this brings me to a, a pause in my presentation. Any questions showing? I have a question for you. I'm not seeing any in the chat, even though I'm begging for them. Um, when you are figuring out probability, let's uh, just pick that. Do you do each um, event or each incident as a standalone? Or in this discussion with your meeting, do you say, well, you know, an earthquake is really low likelihood, but it's so much less than a fire. We're going to put that as not applicable at all. Or do you do you look at each one as a standalone or in comparison to others? You follow Great me? question. So I actually see two pieces to that question. So the first question is, should you evaluate something that's really unlikely? So take avalanche, volcano, something like that. Should you assess that if you're in New York City as a home care agency? So I think what we want to say is no, why bother? But what I actually like to say is put it on the risk list, show it a probability of NA, right? Which is not probable. And then don't take any more time evaluating it. But what you've demonstrated is we considered it. We thought about all the bad things that could happen. This one is a bad thing that can't happen. That's why its probability is NA, it's not gonna happen. And then there's no further scoring for that. It just reflects that the, process that you use considered all possible risks rather than, you know, someone might say, what about this? What about that? Who thought about it? And this is where it sits. The other question I think that maybe you were, you were asking or what I got from your question was what about compounding events? For example, power failure. When the power goes out, we no longer have air conditioning or heat. 
right? We no longer have our alarm systems working. We have our elevators don't work. We have a lot of other problems secondarily. My recommendation strongly is don't compound things. Look at them uniquely as just what they are and whatever that thing presents to you. So power outage, I don't have lights, I don't have power. Things that need power don't have power, but don't compound it to try and assess, well, if that means the trains aren't running and then how, are, how is our staff gonna to get to make visits? It becomes too complex to do in, in a reasonable analysis. Power outage is problem enough. You know, hurricane is problem enough. You don't have to tie it into, what if the hurricane then floods the streets and then the subways can't run for a week, you'll get crazy. So that's my suggestion. Yeah, yeah, and, and what I was what I was trying to get, I, I love that you um, explained to not compound things, but when, when a group is trying to evaluate, um, let's say a dam failure as a zero or an earthquake as a one, you're still looking at each thing individually. You're not saying, you're not looking at them compared to each other as if you had a list of 10 and you're ranking them one to 10. You're just assigning each a score of zero to four as a standalone. It's a zero to four, regardless of its place compared to other things. You're talking about the probability, right? Right, Assessing right, probability. Right. right. So each, each event has its own unique probability, just standing on its own. Okay, right? What's thanks. the probability of your heat system failure? You know, people think dam failure and they say, well, we're in, you know, this is New York City. We don't have dam failure is not our problem. Well, on Staten Island, it's not a problem. But if you're in the Bronx, there are dams north of you in Westchester County that if they were to fail, would flood into the Bronx. Oh, so again, being aware of what the uh, regional risk assessment is would be helpful to understand what that might, what that implication might be. And that flooding would affect things like perhaps mass transit, certainly the highway systems, uh, ability for staff to get around or make visits, things like that. Okay. And that's actually a good illustration to lead into a question we got in the chat is once uh, an agency identifies a new risk, how do they determine and write the actual plan for something they had never previously considered? That's a, that's a really good question. And maybe it begs another question, which is, so now I have a risk exact of 75 things. Do I need a plan for each one of these things? which is a, a, another good question. So first of all, if you've identified a new risk, go put it through your scoring process, right? So new risk and what's the, prob what's the reasonable worst case scenario for that risk? What's the probability that that reasonable worst case scenario will happen? Remember the reason why you want the reasonable worst case scenario is you're gonna gauge what's the likelihood that that scenario could happen. So what's the likelihood of that? What would the impact be of that? What would the uh, what's our readiness to respond to that to give us a vulnerability score? That's part one of my answer. Part two of my answer is, what do you actually need to plan for? In the perfect world, if you had unlimited resources for planning and focus on emergency management, I'd say you should have a plan for everything. But in reality, how does this work? You should have an all hazards comprehensive emergency management plan, which says, how does your agency react to any crisis, no matter what, no matter what the source or the origin or how big it is or small, this is how our agency responds to crisis. We have an incident command system. We activate our emergency plan. We make certain notifications, et cetera, et cetera. And then for those risks that are high on your vulnerability list, let's say the top five, maybe the top 10, or things that have a unique standoff to you, for example, active shooter, which might not be in your top five list, but is actually something that you're real concerned about. For those things, those you would need a unique plan. And we call those plans annexes, an annex to your comprehensive emergency management plan. An annex is sort of a focused sub plan that says, how do we articulate our all hazards plan for that specific event? Did that answer your question? I, I think it did, and we'll uh, hear from the participant. I'm sure if it didn't, I did okay. put in the chat that we are losing you, Zach, here in a minute. So hopefully the questions will come in, and please um, go on. So Zach, uh, I think I think I'm done. I think my next slide is just uh, actually, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, here's my contact information, but more importantly, on the right are some uh, resources that you might look to and the links are there and obviously you can uh, you can communicate them of where you find the the Kaiser Permanente instructions which is Kaiser's version of how do you use their tool 
uh, and also some good resources on Asper Tracy. If you're not familiar with Asper Tracy, it's the HHS Health and Human Services Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response Technical Resources Assistance Center and Information Exchange. It's a great embodiment. It's, it's Google for healthcare emergency management. That's what it is. And you can go there and look at a whole package of information about uh, conducting or, or evaluating hazard vulnerability assessments. So I encourage you to look at that and a couple of other resources for emergency planning. Well, and Zach, as as yeah. Zach mentioned, he did, um, <clears throat> IMS did adapt the Kaiser Permanente tool to be more relevant for home care. So we'll, you will be receiving that actual tool as an attachment in the post uh, webinar materials that you get along with the recording and the slides. We kind of gave you the instructions on the tool before we, we handed you the chainsaw. So you will be getting that. And I really hope you find it useful and um, HCA and HCP are happy to take feedback on that tool once you get it and use it, because I'm sure that would be valuable for Zach and IMS as well. Carol, I had a question for Zach, if he's still there. Um, he is. Okay. Right. I can't see you. So I think you can't you see me. The... I'm here. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Great. So right. I think you made the point, but I want to emphasize it. So when people complete an HBA, the idea is not that it now gets put into their emergency management plan or into their document and put onto the shelf, but it's almost like a starting point to then address some of the risks that you um, have identified and how you're going to address them. And I assume that's in written policies and procedures. Is that correct? It, I, I followed everything you said, except for that assumption. So what, what, when you say you assume that it's in written policies, what is actually in written policies? That you should do an HVA annually or that you should? No, no. Once do you've it? done the HVA, and let's say you've identified the five areas that are a highest risk, right? Does, does the agency's job stop there or do they now have to do something in, in addition and that, that, that may involve writing things down for policies and procedures? Oh, sure. So, so certainly for your highest risks, or your highest vulnerabilities, you would be expected to have an annex or a sub plan or some element of your plan that responds to that. And from a survey standpoint, you should expect that a surveyor is going to ask about that. For example, if you identify, well, we all have pandemic plans, I'll use something else. If you identify cyber uh, attack as a risk or as a high risk priority, a high vulnerability risk for your agency, you should have a cyber attack plan and you should have a strategy laid out for how that's going to work, whatever your plan is going to be. How does that articulate your SEMP, your comprehensive emergency management plan for a cyber event? Absolutely. And by the way, since I mentioned that, part of the uh, surveyor's guidance, and it's certainly worthwhile if you're not familiar to go look this up on CMS's website, but part of the surveyor's guidance for how they assess your emergency planning is to ask leadership, I emphasize leadership, not the emergency management coordinator per se, but senior leadership in the agency, tell us what your highest vulnerability risks are and how did you arrive at that decision? How did you decide, for example, that cyber is a high vulnerability risk? So they may be speaking to your administrator or your executive director and saying, I see on this HVA, you have listed you know, cyber event as a high vulnerability, how did you arrive at that conclusion? And you would certainly be hope, hope that your leadership would be able to speak to that. And of course, this is CMS trying to tell us leadership engagement in emergency planning is really important. So, and, and Zach, I would just clarify that the CMS guidance, I believe really refers more to the certified home health agencies and hospices, that that guidance may not apply per se to LICSs in New York State, but I'm sure the state does look to that when they do their surveys also. So again, I think that's very good advice that you just gave to people. Um, and if you need links to the CMS guidance, just let us know and we can get them to you. I, I know Zach has another engagement and I appreciate him staying more, longer than he expected to. That's fine. Um, a any other questions for me? I, I have not seen any more come in. Um, if we get any, we will surely, um, I will circle back to you. Absolutely. I appreciate your time and your expertise. I'm always enjoy listening to you share. So thank you. Um, thank you. C could I just put in one shameless plug if I could? Please, please New York do. City DOHMH has this awesome 
long-term care emergency, comprehensive emergency management training and technical assistance program that provides our city's home health agencies with technical assistance tailored for you, one-to-one -one relationship with one of our mentors. Uh, we're still happy to take intake if anybody's interested in that. Please speak to Fidel or uh, Danielle Salcido, and uh, I think we'll still find a way to fit you in. So just putting that plug in out there. We're That's happy great. to have you on board. We're going to plug it again when we talk about our upcoming activities, and we'll actually send out um, Danielle's contact information with the post webinar materials. I think we can that's do great. That. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Zach. Have a have a great day. Thanks, Lauren. Everybody, have a great day. Bye. That that was a, a really good. Um, Really good start for everybody. And like I said, you folks will be getting that tool. I especially enjoyed when Zach talked about the questions to ask yourself, um, you know, about a risk. What's the likelihood that this is going to happen in my building, in my town, in my area? Um, you know, it's sometimes tough questions to answer, but it gets the dialogue going with your, your HVA group. So um, that I that's the part I enjoyed the most, I think. So we're gonna change gears a little bit um, and go back to our assessment tool that we did, we accomplished last year <clears throat> and our um, survey summary. So we're gonna have on the following slides, the summary of our findings and some of the recommendations that came out of those findings. Our survey participants provided services to more than 156,000 patients in the New York City region. We know there are a lot more than that. These are just the ones that participated and hopefully we'll get even a larger sample with our next survey. Home care has to be more robustly incorporated into state and regional emergency planning strategies. That's a lot of patients and home care is not always thought of. So we really need to um, step up and get that involvement that we need. Recently, home care sector has been included in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Emergency Management initiatives, and we're thrilled to be working with the New York City team. This is the second year of our grant. We are learning so much, and um, the associations really think that the emergency management team is getting a better idea about our unique needs in home care when it comes to emergency planning and response. We have just the one year of collaboration under our belts, and this survey was a really good tool to kick off our efforts. And um, we are already participating in more drills some more educational opportunities. And the survey findings are, form the basis for those opportunities. So thanks to all who participated and to whoever is going to participate in the future. Next slide. The emergency management assessments findings, as I said, is, is a useful tools forming the basis for state and regional emergency preparedness symposia, workshops, exercises, any other activities that are going to involve health, home care can be informed by the findings from our last survey and hopefully from this future survey. We highlighted the educational needs of the home care sector. The data sparked today's HVA discussion that was the number one requested topic and we brought it to you. And if we hadn't have had this assessment, we would not have known that um, this education was needed. So that's why the data is so important and participation is important. It'll drive our efforts going forward in this year and in future grant years. Next slide, please. So this slide represents the study limitations that we identified. These were included in our summary report um, most of the limitations are tied to the nature of the home care industry in New York State with regards to licensing and regulatory requirements. Andy pointed out um, with Zach that CMS has requirements for CHAS, but maybe not so much for LICSAs. Um, There are different regulations and different requirements, especially when it comes to emergency management for each of the two entities. So um, that was one of the limitations of the survey um, and answer may or may not apply to a different type of agency. We also want to point out that the survey results do not accurately depict compliance with any rules or regulations and must not be construed as such for enforcement purposes. We also want to say that the limitations that you see here do not in any way detract from the importance and the usefulness of the findings. 
as I said, we're already using this data to bring you more relevant and useful information such as the HVA analysis information. Next slide, please. So here we have a partial chart that was also included in our survey summary. It suggests the future activities and the partners that might assist with those activities when it comes to including home care in emergency management efforts. We wanted to point out that the responsibility for addressing all the recommendations that we made is generally shared by the associations, HCA and HCP, but also by New York City Department of Mental Health, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the coalition partners, and even the New York State Department of Health. We do want to note that the associations, HCA and HCP, are taking the lead in addressing further emergency management assessments, such as the one we're planning for the spring that you all agreed to participate in. So um, watch for that. I am going to check on questions and we're going to turn it back over to Andy. Um, we did have one question. New York City has great resources, as mentioned, but what about the rest of the state? Um, Howard, there are a lot of resources for the rest of the state. This presentation is part of our grant activities with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. That's why it was focused on New York City. Um, if you want to email myself or Andy Kosky, our contact information will be included in the slides. We can certainly hook you up with activities in the rest of the state because um, a lot of folks on the call Today, while you may be um, providing services in the city, you may also be providing services outside the city. And we're two statewide associations and are happy to help you with that. I hope Carol, that let me, let me just add, because I think there Thanks. are, like you said, there are a lot of people who do serve Long Island and maybe Westchester. And um, similar to New York City, the rest of the state is divided up into regions where you have these things called health emergency preparedness coalitions. Carol and I, Carol and I can provide information on them. But Howard, I'm so upset that yesterday we had a Lower Hudson Valley had their HEPIC meeting. And not only was it a great meeting in the sense of providing education on programs, um, but there was an exercise held. Um, and I don't think anybody from your agency was there just for home care providers. So I'm just pointing that out because there are a lot of activities outside of New York City. And for folks who serve New York City and outside, they're really wonderful resources available. And again, um, Carol or I can provide more information on that. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Andy. And you can keep right on going with talking about our upcoming activities. It's funny that the first one is that um, program that Zach was talking about. So maybe we want to stress that a little bit. So probably back in September, all of the home care providers that serve New York City were sent information about certain programs and activities run by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And one of them that Zach actually mentioned is this long-term care emergency management and training technical assistance program. And they've already had three webinars. Um, I'm sure they've had two webinars so far. The first one was the essentials of emergency management. The second one was assessment. And the third one next week is planning. And then there'll be one on continuity of operations. And so all of the home care providers were given the opportunity to sign up for this program. So some of you folks may all be participating. But in addition to these uh, webinars or trainings, you also were offered one-on-one -on -one assistance. And Zach was also emphasizing that. And so there's still time until December 15th to register to get this one-on-one -on -one assistance you also can then get access to the prior webinars, the recordings, and then you'll be invited to the, um, the planning one, which is next week, and then continuity of operations. And you have a contact person here. So again, I'd urge folks, if you did not avail yourselves of this, to do it now. Um, you should also know that the city has a uh, emergency management um, exercise design program where they provide training on how to do an exercise and they will actually hold an exercise and again, all of the folks who serve New York City should have been invited. And again, we had about, I think I want to say maybe about 10 agencies did avail themselves of that. And again, if it's continued next year, I would urge you to uh, partake in that. It does involve you know, time, but again, it's well worth it. You get, a, you get a lot of information out of it. 
Um, the next bullet talks about- If I about, could just, I just want to add an extra, extra plug for that technical assistance program, Andy. I mean, I can't believe that, that you have two hours dedicated just for your agency um, for your emergency management, your top two people, or top three people to be one-on-one -on -one with somebody from incident management uh, solutions to address whatever whatever topic in emergency management that you need help with. If you need help with an HVA, they'll help you do that. If you need help with um, you know, recovery, they'll help you with that. Any topic that your agency needs you can have two hours with an expert to address that topic. So really it's a freebie and you only have another week or so to sign up for that. So please do. Yeah, and Thanks. while the city has been running this technical assistance program, the webinars, as you know, it's very hard to have an in-depth conversation when you post a question to the Q&A. So as Carol said, you know, this is a great opportunity and we encourage you to use it. And we actually, I've spoken to a couple of folks who have used it and found it very helpful. Um, the next is our survey, which again, we've been emphasizing throughout. The, one of the new things this year, in addition to trying to delve down further on some of the issues that Carol identified in the first survey, we're collaborating with the Pediatric Disaster Coalition. So we're going to be asking questions that are uh, about working with the pediatric population. And I think that's really going to be helpful um, because pediatrics is a large population when it comes to receiving home care. And this will really allow us to get into some other additional areas. And again, look for that survey coming out probably in February or March. Um, and, and those those questions, I just want to add our bonus questions. So you do not have to work with the pediatric population to um, take part in this survey. Um, those are just for those who serve pediatrics. There are going to be plenty of questions for those who don't. So don't let that shy you away. Yeah, and it's not going to be a long survey. It'll take you like 15 minutes to complete. So mm -hmm. I encourage you to look for that. Um, as I mentioned, we will be holding another forum and we definitely will ask you when you fill out the evaluation form, which will be sent around after this program to put in additional topics you want covered at the next forum. Um, that will help us to plan the agenda. Um, HCA and HCP are also doing an additional webinars. I had mentioned that at the beginning. And then, Carol, you can talk about the transportation project. Um, we are trying to work with transportation providers in the city, um, along with home care agencies, just to get a conversation going um, regarding help that might be needed, ways that med maybe medical transport can help home care in the need, in case of an evacuation need, or things that home care might be able to let the transportation industry know that they may not know. Um, as we've seen with our participation with New York City, we're learning about them, they're learning about us. And unless we have these conversations in groups, um, you know, some of this doesn't happen and those intimate conversations don't happen. So um, watch for that. And if you have any input or you wanna participate, please reach out to me. My information is on the last slide. And Carol, I would add that that's such an important issue. I've been to a lot of meetings where transportation is discussed, but never about home care. It's more about the hospitals. How do we get people to the hospital, out of a hospital, to nursing homes, and vice versa? Very little um, about home care. So that's a great, great idea that you guys thought up of and look forward to whatever you find out from that. Um, I think that's the end of the upcoming activities. I'm going to stop now and see again if people have any additional questions or any other issues that have not been addressed. You can put them in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself, that's fine. I think we're all human beings and we can deal with unmuting one another. Hi, uh, Carol and Annie, this, this is Lauren Campbell. Uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, let me just mute my background here. Excellent presentation. Love the information. I think that uh, the transportation capacity um, webinar or exercise, what's planned for the future is great. Can't wait to see it because if we had to do an HVO, that would probably be or another exercise drill for just us, our colleagues here in industry. That would be a great one to do and, and focus on because we do have problems with that. 
as uh, during activation. It's a great idea. And Your thank phone's you so going to be ringing. I'll be calling you, Lauren. <laughs> Any, anytime you You're need my be input. You're going to be cheerleader for this one. I'm your cheerleader right now, guys. Oh, it's thanks. wonderful. <laughs> thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you, Lauren. Anybody else? And I will repeat that we will be sending out a link to the hand. We'll be sending out the handouts, the evaluation form, the HVA that's been incorporated for home care, um, a link to the recording, and anything else that was discussed. I can't remember anything else that I think that we may have promised to send people, but we will follow up and send it out. Yeah, the the tool that that Zach talked about that they adapted for for home care. I'm not sure if you mentioned that, Andy. Yes. Sorry if you did. Um, and and I know Ariana put a link to the evaluation in the chat, but if you want to wait until you get that packet to um to do the evaluation, that's okay too. Because the link I, um, evaluation will be in your in your follow-up email. Okay, great. Now what I don't think we have listed here, Carol, I can't believe it is our contact information, unless I'm missing it. The um the last slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, yep right, there okay, it is. Here it is. So here, here's who we are that are working on this. And again, uh, feel free to contact any of us. And I will emphasize, you don't have to be a member of HCA or HCP. We wish you were. We think we have a lot to offer you. We think it's really, uh, you're missing a lot of information if you don't in many areas. But for this particular project, this is for anybody who works on emergency preparedness, member or non-member. So keep that in mind and feel free to reach out to any of us and you can see our email address is listed here. So um, I, I want to take a second to acknowledge our colleagues at HCA and HCP that um, didn't appear and, and, and yap at you today. Um, Rebecca Gray, who also worked on the assessment with us, and Kathy Fabreo, President and CEO of HCP, who worked on the assessment with us. Um, all of these folks contributed. And a special, special shout out to Ariana Stone for running all the technology today and keeping everything smooth and running our poll. Um, could not have done this without your help. Thank you. Right. And Ariana also helped us tremendously on the um, survey we sent out mm -hmm. earlier this year. And we'll be, again, working on the survey that we send out um, early next year. So thanks again, Ariana, for that. Um, I don't see any other questions. I, mean, I just want to thank folks. You know. I understand how difficult it is to take time out of your busy schedules, but the fact that you out, you know, allotted two hours today is incredible. And I think it talks about how important it is, but also, of course, how dedicated you are to providing services. So we greatly appreciate that. Um, and just want to wish you a good holiday if we don't speak to you guys. And um, we look forward to working with you in the future. And Carol, any closing words? Just want to thank everyone for their participation. And I hope they walked away with a couple of golden tid tidbits and feel free to reach out to us anytime. Thanks. Great. Joy and peace abound. Thank you. Everyone can feel free to sign off. <laughs>